Well, hello, everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. You are tuning in to the Fortuna series on everything you need to know about the MBA, but maybe afraid to ask. One of those topics that we're going to talk about today is uh, GMAT, GRE, which one should you take, and what should be your test-taking strategy? We'll be consulting one of the dream team experts at Fortuna Admissions, which has gone out of its way to recruit admission insiders who've been you know, reviewing applications and admitting students uh, at the top business schools, and now are there to help you make that journey. And today we will be with a, really a superstar in the world of MBA admissions, Karen Hamu, who is a Columbia Business School grad, a former Deloitte uh, consultant. Uh, Karen has a hundred five-star reviews on Poets and Quants. She's one of the top admissions experts worldwide. Uh, we write about her often in our annual review of the top consultants. So it's a pleasure to see Karen here today. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to see you too, John. Now, I'm imagining, Karen, you took the GMAT to get into Columbia. Am I right? I did take the GMAT, yes, many years that, ago. Yeah, and that's probably because the GRE was less of an alternative if it even existed back then, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It was not common. I'm not even sure it was accepted back then. Yeah. Yeah, and of course it existed, but it was generally used in the early days for applicants to other graduate programs, not specifically business school like the GMAT. So when you advised applicants about their test-taking strategy, what do you tell them? Which tests should they take and how should they determine which one is better for them? Mm -hmm. My clients ask me this often. And my belief, I think applicants should just take whichever test they feel they're best suited for, uh, which really varies by individual. So I usually recommend taking a diagnostic of both and then seeing where they land, seeing which one they feel more comfortable with, and then comparing the results and, um, you know, making the decision from there. Uh, also, we'll often zoom in on the quant section specifically because that's a priority. So um, a lower quant score can raise questions about preparedness for business school. So if an applicant does substantially better on the quant side of one exam over the other, um, that could flag that that test would be a better fit. Is one test easier than the other? Again, it varies by individual. So uh, some people who might be um, quant, said they might like the GMAT better and poets might say that the GRE is easier. Mm, that's what I kind of expected. Now, do schools have a preference? Uh, schools really don't have a preference. So a lot has changed since I took the GMAT back in my day. Um, so now schools really don't have a preference. Applicants are consistently admitted to top MBA programs with both GMATs and GRE. Um, I do think a very high GMAT, say 99th percentile, can really stand out. So it helps schools boost their class averages. It positions students well for scholarships at some of the schools. Uh, but I've also seen GRE scores yield great scholarships. So these days, you know, I really don't see a strong preference from schools. Right. Now, in the past year, we've probably have seen the biggest changes in the GMAT in the GRE than we have since the test went from paper to computer. Uh, what's, what's your sense of how schools are interpreting the scores off these new tests now? So the new GMAT, meaning the focus edition? Yes. Yeah, so some applicants this year will be applying with old GMAT scores and some are going to be applying with new GMAT scores and schools are very aware of this. I mean, I've had a lot of clients already kind of stressed about, you know, my score looks a bit lower on the new GMAT focus. And um, it, what if schools don't understand? Um, and schools very much understand. Um, these are on two different grading scales. The way to compare them is primarily through percentiles rather than raw scores. Um, GMAC has also published a table on their website. Fortuna also has some helpful information on our website on how to compare the two scores since they look different at the surface. Yeah, and they are quite different. Even the, the scoring uh, template is different uh, with the high score of 805 now. And basically, it, it looks like GMAT wanted to slice the salami a little bit uh, more at the upper end to give different schools differentiation on the scores. Um, both tests are a lot shorter than they had been, uh, and a lot of questions have been removed. I wonder if you think the new tests uh, either the GRE or the GMAT 
are as difficult as the old tests? Are they pretty much the same? Uh, are they a little bit easier for a test taker? Well, I haven't taken the new ones, so I don't know. But from what I've been hearing, they're quite similar. Um, similar content, uh, similar difficulty. Someone that gets a 95th percentile on the old one should get a 95th percentile on the new one. So they'd have a, an equivalent score. Yeah. Now, applicants uh, get obsessed with the class profile averages and medians for these standardized tests. And people often look at them and they say, okay, well, if I'm not at the average of the median, perhaps I shouldn't even apply. So my question to you is what score is good enough for admission to an M7 school? Yeah, well, when you look at those class averages, there's a lot that you're not seeing, right? Um, so it's very hard to make assumptions based on, on those averages. You know, someone might have a bit of a lower score and have, you know, an extremely strong professional story or something like that, or um, a higher GPA and a lower GMAT, right? So you don't see the full story when you just look at those stats. As far as which score, what score is good enough for admissions with top school, um, I don't, I don't think there's just a good enough or a minimum. I tell my clients to look at the maximum. Have they reached their personal maximum? And if not, then I want them to go retake the test. Um, if they haven't maxed out their study materials or, um, you know, I, I ask them, have you, how many practice exams have you taken? What should your best score be? And did you hit that best score on the actual exam? And if you didn't, I don't want us to get to the end of the admissions process and look back and have regrets. Um, so if they would have regrets, then we're not done test taking and they should go back and take another test to get to their best. Uh, and it's also important to note that you know, it's not just about the GMAT, right? A very high GMAT or GRE is just one element of how schools assess academic readiness. Um, so, you know, a 780 GMAT doesn't necessarily mean admission to Harvard either. That's true. Now, um, when should an applicant, in fact, retake the test? I mean, some people, I've met people who've taken it 8, 10, 12 times. Um, and then I met people who took it once and they did well and they walked away and walked right into a school. What's, what's your general advice on whether or not to retake the test? Yeah, I guess there's a few criteria, right? So if the score is below a school's published average, and that could be a sign that there's more work to be done, not the only indicator. Um, if the score is significantly lower than the consistent score that an applicant was able to achieve on a series of practice tests, again, retake. Um, I've also seen clients take the test multiple times. Let's say they took it twice and they got a high quant score one day and a high verbal score the other day. Then I want them to go take it again and get their highest quant and verbal on the same day. Um, so that's another indicator that they might need to take it again. Um, if that's not possible, we'll submit both scores to the schools just to show them the applicants best on, on both sides. Um, which also raises an interesting point. Some applicants are afraid to take the exam too many times. They're afraid to be judged, you know, if they took it, use it eight or 10 times. Um, you know, I've had clients that have gotten into the five, six, seven range and get nervous. Um, schools really don't judge on this and a higher score is for, far more important than the number of times the student took the test. And it also shows persistence. I like when my applicants take the test uh, numerous times instead of stopping after, let's say, two, if it's not their best, right? Uh, it shows they have they have that grit, they have that fight in them. Now, Karen, I have a suspicion about practice tests, and I wonder if uh, how you think about this. So I suspect that because the competition between GMAT and GRE has been quite fierce, and the GRE has taken a good amount of market share from GMAT over the last 10 years, that when you take a practice test, it, it behooves GMAT or GRE for that matter uh, to make it a little bit easier so you score higher, so you gain confidence and you actually take their test. Uh, I know that's Machiavellian thinking, but I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, so I guess the official practice tests on their website, I guess we could not trust them. Um, there are some good materials out there that are private that I actually think are even more challenging than the actual test. Um, so I usually steer my clients to those. So if an applicant isn't hitting their target score, uh, and their target score would be the score that they achieved on their practice test that they're satisfied with, what should they do? Yeah, um, 
well, I like for my clients to only have one weakness. So uh, maybe if they have a really high GPA and their GMAT is a little lower, then um, maybe we'll run with it if they really think that that's the best they can do. If they have a lower GPA, though, then I really want them to compensate for it on the GMAT. Um, so again, it depends. Uh, but usually what I see from my clients is if they're struggling, then they either just haven't put in the effort yet. They've been busy at work or for whatever reason, um, they didn't finish maxing out their test prep materials or they need to do something different, right? Use different study materials or work with a tutor who can personalize the approach or even sometimes switch from the GMAT to the GRE. Sometimes we see success there or vice versa, of course. I always think there's a bit of a catch-22 because number one, to get into a good school, you have to have generally a very good uh, background and work experience. And if you do, that means you're working pretty hard and you don't have a whole lot of extra time. And then you have applicants who literally are taking, you know, three months off uh, to study for the test with a $500 an hour tutor. Um, so so you have that aspect. So what, what if, in fact, you're short on time and you're not exactly at your maximum score? Uh, do you how do how do you assess those other elements of, of the application to make sure it's not going to hurt you? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, chatter on online forums about, you know, I, I hear this a lot from applicants that, that other applicants are telling them, well, it's better to apply in round one. So even if you didn't hit your maximum score, you should rush and get the application in, um, which is really doing a disservice to many applicants. So chances are the same in round one versus round two, assuming the application is the same, right? But if somebody's rushing in round one, they're rushing their exams, um, then you know, their application is likely not going to be as strong in round one as it otherwise would be in round two. So if somebody, um, you know, is short on time, I usually encourage them to slow down uh, and, and roll from round one to round two. So uh, I tell all my clients, I want you to apply to business school when you're going to be the best possible applicant that you can possibly be. Um, so if you are at a 675 GMAT on the new scale, which ends in five, uh, and you think you can get to 705, then I'd rather you wait and apply in round two with your 705 because you'll be a stronger candidate. And you're going to have also much more time to write compelling essays because you're going to put the GMAT behind you and be able to focus on application work, which is also uh, a lot of work. Yeah. Do you generally have an idea, rule of thumb uh, to speak? on how many hours someone should actually practice the test, study for the test um, before they actually sit down and take it? Hundreds. Um, it really varies. Uh, but I usually estimate a minimum of three months for thorough prep, and it could be up to six months or even more. I've had clients that have taken over a year. So everyone's different. Again, everybody has different uh workloads at work uh you know who really struggles with taking the gmat my consultants like my clients who are working for consulting firms and they're on the road all the time it'll probably take them much more time to prepare because they don't have a lot of control over their schedule so it can really vary yes exactly right uh you know we once uh surveyed people who scored in the top 10 percentile uh on the gmat and we found that top scorers studied one to three months, 87% of them studied between one and six months, 32% um, uh, studied for less than a month or more than six months. So it's all over the place. It all, all depends on what you bring to the test. You're right. If you're a quant, you're probably going to do naturally better. Uh, if you have an engineering background, you might do better on these tests. Um, if you're a poet, you might, gonna, might struggle with the quant stuff, which is uh, really important. Another question that's really come up, and this is really since the pandemic, when more schools have gone either test optional or have been more generous in granting uh, waivers of standardized tests. And that question is, should you take advantage of a test waiver if schools give you the option? What's your advice? I have very strong opinions here. I am not a fan of test waivers. I've rarely seen them work out. I advise my clients to avoid them at all costs. Um, the background of that is that when COVID hit, test waivers became suddenly quite common. Uh, there were a flood of applications. Many applicants um, applied with rushed applications. They weren't actually ready to apply, not just from a testing perspective, but also from work experience and essay perspective. Um, and it was rare that somebody actually got through with a test waiver. So maybe in a few extreme cases they got through, but even when I had clients get through, they were then waitlisted, which was a flag to go take a test. 
Um, so I am not a fan of test waivers and, and I'd rather somebody just kind of do the work um, up front. Maybe if there's some sort of extremely um, you know, compelling reason for the test waiver, some extreme personal circumstance, maybe that could be okay, but that's pretty unusual. Simply struggling with the GMAT or GRE is not a compelling enough reason. And I would actually rather see a decent, but perhaps slightly lower than average score rather than no score at all. And I think most schools would probably agree based on the behaviors that I've seen from them. Wow, that's really helpful. Okay. advice. That really is. Uh, so Karen, if someone would like to get in touch with you or one of your colleagues at Fortuna, what should they do to connect? Yeah, so they can go to our website. On our website, they can request a free consultation with Fortuna, um, which I really enjoy doing, and I do a lot of them. Um, or they can email me, karen.hamu at fortunaadmissions.com. Why do you have so many five-star reviews? <laughs> um, ask my clients. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, but I really love this work. I, I give it my all. I build strong relationships with my clients. Um, and I guess that pays off on my reviews page on Poets and Quants. There you go. There, there, those are the ingredients of the secret sauce behind Karen Hamu's success <laughs> on Poets and Quants. Uh, and you can read her reviews and they are stellar uh, and even inspiring. And they speak to your commitment, your passion, uh, and your overall devotion to your clients. So congrats for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. For all of you out there, uh, you know, pondering the GMAT versus the GRE, take the one that you can do better on by taking the practice test. Uh, Karen says, you know, be prepared to study for about three months. That doesn't mean every single hour of your day, but setting aside a little time uh, each day, perhaps over a three month period to do your best on the test. Uh, and we are rooting for you. Hope you enjoyed our conversation with Karen. This is part of the Fortuna series on everything you need to know about the MBA and what you may have been afraid to ask. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching.